Hi, my name is Paul, and welcome to month number seven of my $100 per month Canadian stock portfolio series. This time, I'll be going over why many people lose money when investing, and what you can do during a bear market to make yourself much wealthier. In addition to that, I'm going to be showing how my portfolio performed over the last month in comparison to the benchmarked ETFs, and as always, I'll show you exactly how I'm going to be investing this month's $100 of contribution, as well as the dividends earned over the previous month. But first, if you're someone that's new to the series and you're interested in hearing about the goals and rules that I have for investing in this portfolio, then you might want to check out the document linked in the description of this video where I outline all of that in detail. With that said, I'm going to quickly give a brief recap of the companies that I hold within the portfolio. The first and largest holding is the Morgard North American Residential REIT, ticker symbol MRG, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Now, there are two other Morgards on the TSX, so you should make sure that you're looking at the right one with the ticker symbol MRG. And Morgard owns and rents out apartment units in cities and large suburbs throughout the US and Canada. The reason that I've been investing in Morgard is because I believe it's trading at a heavy discount to the net value of its properties, while offering a better price to net operating income than its peers. Also, because Morgard's properties are strategically located in cities and large suburbs that are expected to continue to see population growth over the coming decade, I believe it will give me a good return on my capital over the coming years. So, last month I invested around $70 of my monthly capital into Morgard because it continues to be my strongest conviction in the market. The second largest holding in the portfolio is MTY Food Group, with the ticker symbol MTY, and it also trades on the TSX. MTY operates and franchises fast food, casual dining, and other specialty restaurants, mostly within the US and Canada. More recently, MTY has begun selling and distributing retail food products centered around their successful franchise brands. One of the most important factors contributing to my investment into MTY is the strong history of success in acquisitions and the high level of insider ownership. Also, Based on the management's capital allocation decisions, MTY feels like a company that's being run with its owner's best interests in mind. And in addition to that, MTY has historically provided very good shareholder returns and is currently trading at low earnings and free cash flow multiples compared to its slower growing competitors. This is why last month I invested over $25 of last month's capital into MTY Food Group. The third and final holding in the portfolio is Knight Therapeutics, which trades under the ticker GUD on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Knight is a specialized pharmaceutical company that predominantly operates in Latin America through the licensing, marketing, and distribution of pharmaceutical drugs. What originally drew me to Knight was the past success of the management team who have built a business around acquiring mature and underpromoted pharmaceutical products that have the ability to return capital with minimal added expenses. Currently, Knight trades at a considerable discount to book value, and I believe that the intangible assets from the recent acquisitions will continue growing, and they'll return tangible capital to the business over time. On top of this, Knight loans money to biopharmaceutical companies in return for exclusive rights to produce, market, and distribute successful products developed by the borrowers, which is a low-risk, high-reward model that I believe is being overlooked by the market. Last month, I spent about $5.41 of the month's capital purchasing one share of Knight Therapeutics for the portfolio. So that's absolutely everything that I currently hold in my Wealthsimple portfolio. If you happen to be interested in a more detailed breakdown of these investments, then I'd recommend going back and watching the series from the beginning. In the first few episodes, I cover my reasoning behind these investments much more in depth, and I continue to build on this throughout the series. So if you go down into the description box below the video, there will be a link to the portfolio series playlist, which has every video in this series ordered from first to last for your convenience. Moving along, there weren't any earnings reports or big news stories pertaining to the holdings in the portfolio this month, but there were a few small things worth mentioning. First, we have the Morgard North American Residential REIT, which announced that the monthly dividend will again be paid on July 15th. Also announced was that the second quarter financial results are planned to be released on July 26th and that the conference call will be on the 28th. MTY also announced that their earnings call and second quarter results will be released on July the 8th, which will be before this video comes out, but after I've recorded this segment, so that will be covered in next month's episode. Aside from that, MTY announced that their normal course issuer bid was renewed, allowing MTY to repurchase up to another 1.2 million shares for cancellation. This represents about 5% of the current shares outstanding, and they can be purchased through until July 2023. Also highlighted was that under the 2021 NCIB, MTY repurchased a little under 300,000 shares, even though the company was allowed to buy over 1.2 million. Now, this is understandable considering the impact of COVID on the business during the earlier part of the year, but I suspect that the management will be allocating more capital towards repurchases this year. 
noting that it is very possible that the macro effect of the Fed's rate hikes pushes the public and private markets into a state wherein many quality restaurant companies are prime for acquisitions at low prices. So I wouldn't be too surprised if a big merger or series of smaller acquisitions are in the cards for MTY over the coming year. That said, if quantitative tightening strategies overshoot the mark to where consumers are eating out much less often, even at the more value-centric banners like those in MTY's portfolio, we could see MTY's focus return to paying down the debt load. So I think that it's fair to say that MTY's pathway forward has a good deal of uncertainty in the short to mid-term. And I think that the same can be said about Knight Therapeutics, who had nothing really of note to report on over the course of the month. But I think that this is a good point to transition into talking about why many investors, and especially newer investors, lose money in the market. And this is because I believe that it's due to the overfixation on the near and medium term, while neglecting to account for the key drivers of long-term success. See, everyone who invests in the market has the goal of making more money. And naturally, the idea of being able to achieve these goals quickly is going to be very appealing. Unfortunately, with how market cycles tend to work and the availability of certain risky investment tools, this also leads to a particularly brutal churn of people who invest in the market. Most investors' portfolios, including my own, are lower than they were six months ago, and if you're someone who started investing within the last year or two, you're probably down on many if not all of your positions, especially if you happen to join in on popular investment trends over that period of time. Now, when you started investing, you probably didn't do so under the assumption that you'd end up losing money, and even if you did understand that as a possibility, the recent downturn has likely been a sobering experience. Seeing your accounts go from green to red is enough to make most people feel that sinking feeling of dread in the pit of their stomach, especially if the balance represents a significant portion of your life savings. So, let's take a look at what could be going wrong. A wise man once said that the first rule of investing is don't lose money. And the second rule of investing is to never forget rule number one. So it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that many investors are losing money because they're using strategies that have very low rates of success and much stronger odds of losing significant capital. Day trading, buying options and futures contracts, investing with margin debt, speculating on future developments, using technical or chart analysis, and putting money into businesses that don't generate profits are all quintessential to gambling for the average investor. In fact, Using these methods have reduced many a professional fund manager's portfolio to scraps, and in some cases, it's led them to bankruptcy. Now, covering all of these in depth is going to be a bit too broad for this video, but if there's enough demand for a video outlining why each of these methods produce on average very poor results for investors, then I'll happily oblige with a dedicated video on the topic. But for now, the takeaway should be, don't use risky investment tactics to try and get ahead. They can and have left many aspiring investors broke and scornful. Instead, to improve the odds of success, investors should first limit actions that increase the odds of failure. Now, my content is generally geared towards an audience with a long-term investment mindset, so you likely aren't relying on any of those strategies mentioned to begin with. With that in mind, I'm going to move on to the tricky nature of the market. Obviously, if you think you're doing something wrong, then a logical conclusion would be to stop doing that thing. But what if you're doing everything right? It's important to be aware that market crashes happen. They're inevitable. And more often than not, these corrections will also negatively impact the short and medium term prices of securities that will go on to become great long term investments. See, investing can be somewhat strange in that the payoff for making a correct decision today can be several years out. Meanwhile, stock prices can be completely disconnected with the performance of the underlying business, and your investment might just need more time to come to fruition. In that instance, these losses shouldn't be cause for concern, and should instead be seen as buying opportunities. To help illustrate this, I'm going to highlight a couple of historical examples of great stock investments during bear markets, as well as some of the wisdom shared by these investors who had the conviction to buy when everyone else was choosing to sell. First, let's go back to 1973. Almost two decades before I was born, the market was crashing from a combination of factors including OPEC's oil embargo, the revelation of Watergate, and the devaluation of the US dollar after the abolishment of the gold standard under the Bretton Woods system. At the time, this was the worst stock market crash since the Great Depression, some 40 years earlier. In 1985, Walter Schloss, the late fund manager of WJS Partnership, recalled the impact of the 73 crash on his 1971 investment into a railway conglomerate stock called Western Pacific Industries. In this interview with Catherine Welling of Barron's, reprinted and made public by Columbia Business School, 
Schloss said, quote, the stock was coming in by the buckets around six. Nobody seemed to want it. Schloss continued on, noting that in 1979, the company would end up paying out a special cash dividend of $23 per share. And at the time of the interview in 1985, the shares were trading at over $112. Yet, a little over a decade earlier, and people didn't even want to touch it at six. Now, in case you haven't heard much about Walter Schloss's track record, his fund recorded an average annual return of over 20% throughout his 28-year management tenure. Part of his secret to achieving these market-beating returns involved focusing on taking advantage of discounted stocks. Here's what he had to say about buying cheap stocks in the midst of the 1973 bear market when he was interviewed by Forbes in an article called Making Money Out of Junk, which was again reprinted and made publicly available by Columbia Business School. Quote, the thing about buying depressed stocks is that you really have three strings in your bow. One, earnings will improve and the stocks will go up. Two, someone will come in and buy control of the company. Or three, the company will start buying its own stock and start asking for tenders. Put simply, Walter believed that when a stock had been counted out by the market, that was usually a good opportunity to start buying. This is because bad times usually don't last forever. Though, during bad times, irrationality in the market can see many quality businesses priced as though the future is dire. Let's now take a step even further back in time and take a look at the worst market crash in American history, the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, major banks collapsed, a record number of people were impoverished and unable to find work, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped nearly 90% from its peak in October of 1929 to the bottom in mid-1932. The bottom of the crash marked a quarter century of market gains wiped out. It was immensely brutal, and market sentiment trended so fearfully that many stocks were being traded as though it was the end of America. But that was not the case, and investors who were courageous enough to invest in the aftermath would be handsomely rewarded. One such investor was the oil tycoon John Paul Getty, who was somewhat lucky in receiving his inheritance in 1930, shortly after the market began to freefall. That said, Getty's decision to invest in the market through the Depression was incredibly rational and intentional. And in 1932, Getty chose to invest in a company called Tidewater Associated Oil for $2.50 per share. Within five years, the stock's price increased more than sixfold. But this was far from Getty's only market success. See, John Paul Getty was a bargain hunter through and through, and though I couldn't find his exact rate of return, it's clear that he was a savvy investor based on his written commentary detailing strategies he'd used to achieve remarkable results. This, in addition to his business acumen, would eventually lead him to becoming the world's richest man for over two decades running. Here's a written quote from his book entitled How to Be Rich that summarizes his investment mindset. Quote, The big profits go to the intelligent, careful and patient investors, not to the reckless and overeager speculator. The seasoned investor buys his stocks when they are priced low, holds them for the long pull rise, and takes in between dips and slumps in stride. Reflecting on Getty's investment philosophy, the crux of the ideology is very similar to that of Walter Schloss, in that they both focused on buying stocks when prices and sentiment were low. But they're not the only ones. In fact, the number of super investors who have achieved long-term market-beating results almost all tend to be eager investors during a market downturn. From Peter Lynch investing in Taco Bell as it dipped from $14 down to one, to Howard Marks investing $600 million per week for 15 weeks after the collapse of Lehman Brothers in the 2008 financial crisis, to Benjamin Graham, whose entire strategy revolved around investing in stocks that had been discarded like used cigar butts, it shouldn't come as a shock to learn that the historically successful stock market investors all have this trait in common. So, I'll finish up this segment with a quote from someone who you're all undoubtedly aware of, the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, who in the 1986 Berkshire Hathaway annual letter to shareholders had this to say, quote, Occasional outbreaks of those two super contagious diseases, fear and greed, will forever occur in the investment community. The timing of these epidemics will be unpredictable, and the market aberrations produced by them will be equally unpredictable, both as to duration and degree. Therefore, we never try to anticipate the arrival or departure of either disease. Our goal is more modest. We simply attempt to be fearful when others are greedy, and to be greedy only when others are fearful. Like these super investors, 
I believe that it is more important to take advantage of price declines to invest in high quality businesses. But I'm still susceptible to fear and worries. So when the bad feeling I get from seeing unrealized losses creeps its way in, I always try to correct this mindset by reminding myself that share prices don't mean anything until it comes time to actually cash them out, and that they can be expected to act wildly and irrationally over time. So when I've locked on to a company that is offering great capital returns, then I don't focus on how much my investments have declined in price. Instead, borrowing another insight from the Buffett School of Thinking, I look at the percentage decline as if it's a sales tag on something that I plan to buy in bulk. For instance, if I went to the grocery store and saw that my favorite non-perishable snacks were on sale for 30% off what the price was last time, I wouldn't pass up on the deal just because I thought the price could go even lower next time. When stuff I like goes on sale, I tend to be the kind of shopper who loads up the cart, and that's especially true when investing. That said, if looking at the price drop as a discount doesn't make it harder for yourself to pass up on the deal, then I find that it can also be helpful to instead focus on the variables that you can control like increasing the number of shares that you own and lowering your cost basis per share. Now, if this still doesn't convince you to take advantage of the bargain, then hopefully it at least puts a little voice in the back of your head that'll warn you against selling out of your shares during the low points of a market correction. Because not participating during the downtrodden years usually leads to missing out on the large payoff when things eventually turn around. After all, if you don't need to sell your investments anytime soon, then you're most likely better off building out your position throughout a very long bear market when share prices are trading cheaply, rather than getting the early emotional payoff of seeing a bunch of smaller positions in the green. So to conclude this segment, I believe that it's because losses are so emotionally challenging that many new investors never get to experience the financial rewards of persevering through a tough market, and instead they hop in at euphoric highs just in time to watch the market rapidly revert back to the mean, carrying their investment capital away with it. This is why I try not to let negative emotions cause me to miss out when prices and sentiment are at their lowest, because I believe that's where I'll be getting the best deals and eventually the best returns. Now, none of what I said here was anything new or revolutionary, but when the market is going through a period of struggle, I think that it's important to refresh our understanding of why we're driven to act counterproductively towards our goals and how we can overcome the negative emotions in order to achieve financial success. With that said, let's take a look at the damage that's been done to the portfolio over the past month. Starting with Morgard, last month I bought four shares of the REIT for an average share price of $17.55, and these shares have declined by 6.04% to $16.49. But this doesn't account for the dividend that was paid. Including the dividend of 5.83 cents per share, this slightly improved Morgard's return for the month to negative 5.71% as of market close on Thursday, July the 7th, 2022. Next, I bought one share of Knight Therapeutics for $5.41. And at the end of the month, the share had increased in price by a whopping 0.18%, ending the month at $5.42 per share. Finally was MTY Food Group. Last month, I bought roughly 0.475 shares of MTY for an average whole share price of $53.65, and the fractional share has since increased in price by roughly 2.87%. This means that as of July 7th, the invested capital for the month has decreased in value by 2.31% when accounting for the dividends paid, leaving the portfolio with a total of $558.24 cents on invested capital of $600 and reinvestments of $2.48 in dividends. Now, if my whole segment about mentally preparing yourself for investing during market corrections didn't make it obvious that things weren't going to be looking good, then let me just say that June was a rough month, and not just for me. Checking in on the benchmarks, this month the Global Value ETF with the ticker VVL was the worst performer, underperforming my portfolio by 8.18%. Next was the Canadian large cap ETF with a ticker symbol VCE, which underperformed my portfolio by 5.29%. The second best ETF this month was the Canadian all cap ETF, ticker VCN, which also underperformed my portfolio by 4.7%. Finally, the best performing benchmark over the month of June was the S&P 500 index VFV, which only lagged my portfolio by 2.86%. Also, none of these funds paid distributions as of Thursday, July 7th. That said, VFV shareholders will be receiving dividends on the 8th, 
and both VCN and VCE will be receiving their dividends on the 11th, and this will of course be included in next month's calculations. Since the portfolio's inception, which has been half a year now, if I'd invested $100 per month into each of the indexes as well as my own portfolio, then the results would be as follows. The worst performer would have been the Global Value Index, which would be worth $543.98, which is a loss of 9.5%. In second last position currently is the Canadian All Cap Portfolio, which would be worth $547.84, representing an 8.69% loss on $600 of contribution. Next is the S&P 500 portfolio, which is currently worth $549.28. This represents a loss of 8.45%. The current runner-up is the Canadian Large Cap ETF, worth a total balance of $550.20, for a total 6-month return of negative 8.3%. In first place is my portfolio, which is currently sitting at $558.24 for a total return on contribution of negative 6.96%. To comment on this, I guess I'd say that it's nice that my portfolio is back on top of the benchmarks, but it's been a rough month and all the portfolios have been fairly neck and neck throughout. So the fact that mine ended up on top after this very volatile month is really more luck than anything, as I'm sure you're sick of hearing me say by now. But there really hasn't been any breakout performance or anything like that, and the gap between my portfolio and the worst performing benchmark is only about 2.5% of the total contribution up to this point, so I'm definitely not considering this as much of a win, especially considering how far away I am from my goal of 12% per annum. To be on par with that goal right now, my portfolio would need to be up $15.41, but instead my portfolio is down $41.76. So there's a lot of ground that needs to be made up in the coming months or possibly even years. On a more positive note though, after the six month period, my portfolio's balance has still yet to fall below that of the S&Ps on a month over month basis. Though this is more of a fun fact than anything since the market has been mostly downtrending throughout the series and the potential for the S&P to have a big recovery when sentiment rallies is far from out of the question. With that said, let's move on to discussing how I plan to invest this month's $100 of contribution and the $1.17 in cash dividends. I will say that this month I am seeing a lot of good deals out there, but I'm still looking to pick up the usual grouping just because I like the price of Morgard too much to forego that investment, and I don't want to sell a significant portion of either of my other stocks at these prices, which is what I would be doing in order to buy a certain separate company that I've had my eye on for a while now. So this month, I'm just going to be buying my usual four shares of Morgard, but because they're over a dollar cheaper than last month, I'm also going to be buying two shares of Knight instead of only buying one share, like I'd been doing in the previous months. This is mainly because I'm happy with the sizing of Knight's holding within the portfolio and I don't want to see it drop below 10%, at least not while it's still trading in the low to mid $5 range. And of course, the remainder will be invested into MTY Food Group. So let's get into the clip of me buying shares. Okay, so here I am in the Wealthsimple account. We have $656.67 with $101.17 that we can invest. So let's get to it. First, we're going to start by buying our Morgard shares, and we will get four of those. Okay, next up, we're going to get our two shares of Knight Therapeutics. Looks right. And that should leave us with about $25-ish, $24.09 to throw into MTY. So let's put that $24.09 into a fractional buy. That looks right. Buy. Confirm. And done. And that should be pending. So I will get back to you once that comes through. All right, and I'm back a fair amount later on, actually, and this is a bit weird, but I was a bit later than usual getting to the share buying this month, and I was waiting on my confirmation email on the MTY order, and it just didn't come in. 
So I hop back onto Wealthsimple and apparently the fractional buy will be filled on Monday the 11th. Um, but it also says that it could be canceled and I didn't really expect to have a scenario like this play out so early on in the portfolio, but I'll quickly go through how I'm going to handle the accounting of this on my spreadsheet. And it's actually pretty easy. I'm just going to mark it as though the pending $24.09 is being held in cash. That way, if the trade goes through, I can just note it as a pending trade that completed in July. And if it doesn't go through, then the cash position is already in place on the portfolio. Also, because there might be some questions and concerns regarding rule number two of the series, which says that I can only place trades on one day each month, I'll quickly go over that as well. The reason for the word placed here is specifically to allow me to use strategies like placing limit orders that may last more than just one day. In this instance, because the order was placed on the only day in July that I made a trade, it is still in line with the rules of the portfolio, regardless of when the placed trade is filled. With that said, my purchase of two Knight Therapeutic shares was confirmed for $5.40 each, as were my four shares of Morgard, which were filled at a price of $16.57 each. So I'll put that into the spreadsheet and be right back. Okay, taking a look at the spreadsheet now that everything has been updated, the portfolio now holds 28 shares of Morgard worth $465.08, making up 70.7% of the portfolio. The second largest holding is MTY Food Group, and I still have 1.6462 shares worth $87.50, comprising 13.3% of the portfolio. Next is Knight Therapeutics, and it makes up 12.34% of the portfolio because of the 15 shares that are currently worth a total of $81.15. Finally, because of the pending offer on MTY shares, the portfolio holds 3.66% of Schrodinger's cash, which will hopefully turn out to be MTY shares on the 11th. And that cash position is valued at $24.09. Moving on to the distributions, this month the portfolio received a distribution from 20 shares of Morgard, which brought in $1.17, and that was the only distribution received within the month. As for ex-dividends, Morgard is the only security that has announced plans to pay a distribution in July, and the portfolio was holding 24 shares on the date of qualification, which should bring in $1.40, and if this projection is correct, it should push the cumulative distributions received within the portfolio to $5.05. As for the yield on cost, which measures how much will be earned in dividends over a one-year period assuming nothing changes, I can now expect to receive $19.59 per year from my 28 shares of Morgard. This will give my Morgard holdings a yield on cost of 3.83%. On my 1.646 shares of MTY Food Group, nothing has changed at all and I still expect to receive $1.38 in dividends per year for the same yield on cost of 1.58%. And these are the only two securities that pay distributions within the portfolio, so when combining these two distributions, I can expect to receive a total yearly return from distributions of $20.97, giving the monthly portfolio a current yield on cost of 2.98% assuming no changes to the current payments or number of shares held. Meanwhile, the yield on contribution, which only factors in the money that I've directly put into the account, is now 3%. And just a brief mention on this part, the pending offer on MTY is, of course, somewhat suppressing the yield on cost. So assuming that the same thing doesn't happen next month, you can pretty safely expect the yield on cost and contribution to jump back up a bit. So that's going to be it for this one. As always, I encourage that you use the information presented in this video as a starting point to do your own research into companies that interest you. This video is not financial advice and it doesn't have the information necessary to make good investment decisions on individual securities. This video was made entirely for the purpose of providing inspiration and insight into my own personal investment decisions. I am not a financial advisor. I'm just a Canadian who likes to invest and share my opinions with others. And in doing so, I hope I was able to provide you with some value. And if I did, then please consider sharing it with anyone who may also benefit from it. Thank you for watching all the way to the end and enjoy the rest of your day.